Say hello to a neighbour. <laughs> Give us a couple of minutes, I'll be there. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, thanks for those words that came out. Um, you know, I, just it was awesome. There was a real beautiful presence of the Lord, and and it's like an invitation. Is I was sort of sort of like a, I was thinking of hot pools and ham. ham no, sorry, I went to ham the last weekend. So actually, I didn't go in the hot pools. I didn't. But um, but I was thinking, you know, when you go in, don't you like all uh, the old and the the uh, you know, just so cleansing, isn't it? It freshens you up and. And just those pictures that were coming out of actually like of Jesus going around and picking up pieces and putting things back together, healing, restoring. Um, the the song that Rachel did, the, or the chorus or the, the prophetic word there about that actually, that he fights the battles and that actually would we, if we come to him, we lay down, we surrender, that actually he's the one who uh, the, the victory comes through. And uh, this morning, it's cool, we've got this... Um, story actually we're nearly on the if you remember this journey that we're on with uh, the disciples going with Jesus and now journeying from the north Galilee and heading down to Jerusalem and and really and uh, about to enter into Jerusalem this is the last sort of story in that section and it's about them walking with him and and it's about the miracle uh, of uh, blind Bartimaeus uh, receiving his sight and and so I saw Gay came in this morning, and uh, and so I she left an amazing message on our phone a, a few weeks back, and we thought, oh wow, got to get that testimony um, sorted. And and of course, never got round to it. As I say, Greg was, was super busy at the moment. And oh, actually, hey, so just to let you know, we do have a donut maker. <laughs> <laughs> It is official, it is official, and apparently we've got multiple hoppers, we can do the mini donuts, or we can do the huge, you know, the normal size donuts as well, so man, when we get the coffee machine, a milkshake maker, and a deep fryer as well, so man, we're going to be able to have a real good feed. We're looking to start a ministry in terms of Weight Watchers as well, is it? <laughs> so, um, but actually, we actually felt like making that you know, that kitchen's a central thing, and a part of, because it's fellowship, right, it's food, and, and so um, we're really excited about what this, you know, the build is going to mean going forward, and, um, and I'm looking forward to the donuts. So um, anyway, that's been pre- pretty busy, so get back, in, back to Gay, I saw her this morning, and I, so I, I ran over and said, hey, you wouldn't mind sharing your testament of, like, what's happened, and uh, so with about three songs notice, um, she's happy to do that. So, Gay, would you like to come up and be awesome just to hear uh, what happened? Just a warning, I will cry, okay? Just so you know. Tears of joy. Um, yes, it's good to be back. Far out. This church is a massive blessing to us, an absolute blessing, and we are looking forward to being here. Um, back in March in 2020, I had a unexpected brain bleed. Uh, we were living in Tauranga at the time. And um, I was in hospital, and obviously, and um, it wasn't good. I didn't really know the effects of you know, how bad it was, but uh, we were told, well, Tony was told that, you know, most people don't survive this because it wasn't very good. Anyway, um, I had a wonderful time in in hospital. I was so covered with the Holy Spirit, and and, um, what had happened was, it happened in the sensory part of my brain, so it affected sight, hearing, taste, temperature, you name it, everything. But the worst part, my hearing is sensitive and annoying, so I wear earplugs a lot. But the, the worst part was my eyes. I had blind spots in the peripheral on the left side of both eyes. And I'm talking decent blind spots, enough that when my grandkids stood beside me on the left, I'd stand on their feet because I couldn't see them because a lot of it was all down around here. So anyway, but I was full of the joy of the Lord and um, pastors came in and prayed for us and, and for me and it was just wonderful. And anyway, God said to me so clearly, um, I'm going to restore you 100%. I'm having that, 
I'm taking it. And I took it and I grabbed it and I thought, I remember hearing my eldest boy say to me, God cannot lie. He's truth. He can't lie. I'm having that and no one's taking that off me. So I've clung on to it now for nearly two and a half years. And I can honestly say I've never doubted what he told me. But boy, there's been times when I've said, hurry up, please. This is horrible. I hate it. Um, (laughs) Please, I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. And all sorts of words to get him to hurry up. And I did end up having a peripheral test done. Um, oh, I don't know, maybe a matter of months afterwards, and it showed where the blind spots were. And where, like the brain can repair itself. Okay, the eyes are good, it's just the message is not getting from the eyes to the brain. And where there was no sight were, blind, were black patches, quite big black patches. You can see them on the scan. And I'll tell you what, if there are, anyone's interested in looking at it, Tony's got the pictures of both. There's two scans. And um, the grey ones were where there's vision, but it's not great. And then white is where I could see. Anyway, um, my, I hated it. I just said to Tony, look, at this is awful. He said, do you know what? He said, I see this as good because this is a starting place. This is a positive. This can mean you can only get better. And yes, I have got incredibly better, so much better. I'm still got patches and I... Um, still live in a puffer jacket most of the time because one minute I'm hot and the next minute I'm cold and <laughs> it's like my blanket of you know comfort but anyway um, I just thought I can't I can't doubt my god so anyway um, we were heading back up north to visit the family we hadn't seen them for a year and um, I've been getting these funny lights and and funny floaters in my eyes and I thought I was starting to get like anxious oh what's wrong and because that tends to be me a little bit. I'll err on the side of negativity and freak out. Anyway, I went to the back and got it checked. And she said, oh, no. She said, um, you've got floaters. That's natural for your age and, and whatnot. And, um, and she said, everything is fine. Well, we do your peripheral while you're here. Anyway, while we were here in church, because I wasn't wanting to go and, and um, have it checked because I didn't want bad news because I refused to accept that. But anyway... I had prayer here lots of times for all sorts of things. And I can remember one time coming up, crying as I do as soon as I get at the front. I just need some help. I need, please, God, I just need something. Give me something. I just want a bit back, you know, please. And I think it was Greg who prayed for me. I'm not sure. But anyway, I just, I always feel God's presence immediately as soon as I just think of him. And and I just got so filled. and, um, And I knew things had changed because you cannot come into the presence of God without something changing in you. You just don't come out the same. You all, there's always a change. And I just knew there was change because he'd, he'd touched me. So anyway, um, I started to yeah, think, wow, yeah, hmm, I think I can see better. I think things are improving. Anyway, so I had the courage. You go on, do the peripheral test. So she did the peripheral test for me. Wow, actually I'm not going to cry because it's so exciting. There are no black spots left on the scan, which means there is every part of my eyes can see. And there are grey patches, which means that, yeah, I can see movement. It's like I couldn't see, it's hard to explain it. It's like I can't, I couldn't see that, but I know that my eyes can see it. I know it, it's... It's hard to explain it, and I can see movement, but I can't see it, but I can see it. It's like the eyes can, and the eyes trying to tell the brain, and the brain's only getting a mixed message, so no, far out. So, um, yeah, prayer is wonderful. God is great, and don't give up. I have told so many people. I was told in the hospital, don't expect that to come back 100%. Um, it, you know, the brain can fix itself, but, you know, it's a lot of damage. And just you, and the worst thing that I got when I walked out of that hospital was a nurse said to me, get used to your new, the new you. I'm not accepting that. I'm not the new you in that respect. No, I know what God promised, and I'm hanging on to that. So he is. He's so faithful, so never, ever give up. And when he tells you something, don't doubt it. Don't ever doubt it, because he's faithful. Thanks, Gay. That's awesome. Woohoo. So, that sort of segues really nicely, actually, into 
uh, into blind Bartimaeus, right? And, and so this is the story of Jesus uh, on the road. Actually, Daniel, can you throw up that map? Can you show you the, what it looks like? So this is the journey that, if you remember, up in Galilee, and uh, to avoid Samaria, like often they would uh, come down, they would cross the Jordan and come down like the south side, and then back across to Jericho and then to Jerusalem. And so Jericho is actually uh, 280 meters below, uh, below sea level, like it's quite low down, and it's a big climb up, so if you've ever been to the Dead Sea and around there, um, so the... The climb up to Jerusalem is a really steep climb. And so this is where the setting is, that, um, that uh, Jesus and the dis- uh, disciples are, have, have got to Jericho and now they're moving towards uh, Jerusalem. And it's significant, this whole, and, and it's a metaphorical of what discipleship looks like. Can you remember the disciples, they were jostling about who's number one. Um, Jesus was teaching about marriage and money and kids, you know, the, some of the three of most challenging areas of, of following Jesus in those areas that, uh, you know, in life that it's, it's difficult to go in. And, and so it, it, it peaks at this point in the story with blind Bartimaeus, and it's like, this is what faith looks like. This is what following Jesus looks like. This is what discipleship looks like. And it's ironic, actually, that that. Bartimaeus, you know, who's a blind beggar, actually sort of uh, shows us more clearly it's, uh, than, uh, than what the disciples do of what discipleship actually looks like and what it should exemplify. It's also significant that Bartimaeus is the only person in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, so the synoptic gospels, that that's actually named. Everyone else is... Uh, we do not know the name for, but Bartimaeus, we do. Um, and, and we know that he was a beggar from Jericho. And so how can a blind man see Jesus better than his disciples? Like, how does that work? So let's, uh, let's read the story and, and uh, discover what, what it was all about and what happened. Jericho is actually one of the most oldest and ancient cities in the Middle East, and it's been it's been inhabited for thousands of years. And I, I went there when I went to Israel, and man, you can buy amazing figs there. But it it really is a crossroads and a hub uh, for travellers going north, south, and east and west. And um, well, well, and that's probably why Bartimaeus was there, um, because man, it's a, it is, if you're going to beg, uh, it's a good place too. So Mark 10, this is uh, 46 to 52 to the end of the chapter. It said, then, then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large cloud, crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. He had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. and he bega- Sorry, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he did, began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So can you imagine, so they're walking up, you know, uh, rocky, sandy ground, uh, coming up out of the the valley of um, the Jordan up towards Jerusalem. And it's a large crowd. So it's more than just the disciples. Like It's showing that, like, that people are, had, had, there was this anticipation and this excitement about, this, about Jesus. And what's he going to do? He's going to the, the heart of our spiritual nation. And, uh, and he's a healer. You know, he's a deliverer. He's a teacher like no one else. With, he's a miracle maker. He can calm storms with a single word. Like what is he going to do in Jerusalem? Is he going to overthrow? Is he going to start? Is he going to, is he going to, de- like he, he stood up to the, the Pharisees and the religious establishment and he's, he's called them out. Like this guy is, is incredible. And so there's this excitement of like, man, what the heck is going to happen when we get to Israel, when we get to Jerusalem? And so all these people are, 
are coming with him. And you could imagine the, the sound of the feet and the rustling and the movement and the, and the, and the chitter-chatter as, as they are making their way towards um, Jerusalem. And, and it says that, um, so Bartimaeus is by the side of the road. And he's a, and he's a beggar and he's completely and utterly dependent on the generosity of others. And it's really interesting that in other locations, right, as it talks about like the sick were brought to Jesus. Like the friends, you know, you remember they ripped open the roof and lowered him down. Um, the Jairus' daughter sent the servants. You know, people uh, went out to call Jesus to, the, to, um, you know, to come and, and help my son or daughter or whoever. Not so Bartimaeus. He's, this time, it's just him. No one cares. Like, he's a stranger. He's just on the side of the road. They don't know him. And they're like, like shut up. You're a, you know, you're a bottom feeder. You're, no one cares. It, you're, you're, you're irrelevant. Don't, don't disturb this important guy. He is heading to Jerusalem. And so there's this, this tension in the story. And, and it's ratcheted up uh, further. Mark it says that it's, this is, and he, he uses the phrase, Jesus of, of, of Nazareth. And, and it's only used here in, in the first miracle in chapter 1, verse 23. And actually, what it, in, the, in the Greek, it, it actually says, he's um, it's Jesus the Nazarite, or the Nazarene. And, uh, and if you did the search, you find actually that phrase and that terminology is used only in one other place in the Bible, and that's where S- uh, Samson is explaining to Delilah who he is. And he's like, I'm a Nazarite. I'm a set apart from God. A for, you know, and he's explaining why he has this powerful anointing and, and a super strength. And so Mark is sort of saying, this is not Jesus from Nazareth. This is Jesus the Nazarite. This is the one. And he's emphasizing it by talking about it like this is the first in chapter one this was the first miracle and this one here uh with Bartimaeus is the last miracle in the book of Mark this is the last healing miracle that Jesus done as does and it's significant and so there's this sense this tension it's like wow so what's he gonna do this powerfully anointed one and um Jesus who's walking along the road And this beggar, you know, cries out and starts yelling, Son of David, have mercy on me. You know, do you feel like you're cast aside this morning? Do you feel like you're kind of in bits like that picture that was coming out? That uh, that, it feels like your life's in in pieces? Well, there's hope. And his name is Jesus. When there's no other... You know, there's nothing else. There's him. And, uh, and it says, actually, that he stopped and stood still. That's what in the Greek, uh, in the, it's like he's walking along and he hears this phrase, Son of David, have mercy on me. And in front of all the crowds and the talk, you know, over the dim, and the, he hears this voice and it says that he stopped and he stood still. And he stops and stands still for you as well. What is significant about this phrase? He says, son of David. Because that phrase stopped him. And it's a unique phrase. It's not used really in uh, a couple of other places in the New Testament. Uh, but but it is, uh, it's unique. And, uh, and it goes back. It's actually a prophetic messianic uh, utterance by Bartimaeus. It's like he's saying, I know who you are. I know what your call is on your life. And, and the background is this. And so we've got to dive back nearly a thousand years, actually, to 2 Samuel uh, 7. And the background is that David was, had just, his kingship had just been fully established. He had fought his key battles and he had squashed the enemy. And he's now sitting on the throne. He's been uh, he's been anointed not just by uh, his tribe, you know, Judah and Benjamin, but the, all the tribes. And they've said, yep, you're our king after the, the fighting with Saul and then also with the Philistines, etc. And, uh, and he's thinking, woohoo, like, 
thank you, Lord. Like, thank you for making me king. And I'm, I am wrapped. I'm stoked. You know, and uh, there's got to be, and he's sitting in his palace, right? And it's made of cedar. And he's like, you know what? What can I do for God? You know, his, his palace or his place is this little tent. You know, it's in canvas still. It's, it's this tabernacle. And, and he's like, well, you know what? I'm going to make you a temple, God. I'm going to build a palace for you. And, and that's, that's where he's thinking. He's thinking, man, I've, you know, you've given me this kingdom, so um, I'll, I better do something back. Um, and, and it's interesting. And, and so what happens is Nathan the prophet is sent to David uh, by the Lord. And this is what he says in 2 Samuel 7, 11 to 16. He says, the Lord declares, this is Nathan talking to, Daniel, uh, to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom. So he's saying, I'm going to establish it, David. I'm going to build the house. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Wow. He will be, sorry, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will neither be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. That's quite a prophetic word, isn't it? And, and actually, one of the keys in it, I want to unpack it, because there's this now and not yet, there's this, he talks about that your offspring will succeed you, or in the New King James, it's like this, your seed will um, uh, sorry, I'll raise up the seed um, to succeed you, your seed. And he's talking about, and I'll establish his kingdom. And so there's this, there's this lineage of kings, right, that are going down, that are going down through David's line. That, and he's saying both that that kingdom and that seed I'm going to establish forever, but, but there's a seed, there's a singular, there is a king coming whom I will establish his throne and his kingdom will be forever and I will be his father and he will be my son. And he goes on and, uh, and it's going to be something and it's going to be forever. You see, when, so to, to step back from this, you see, Adam represented all of us right in the garden at Eden. And when he fell, we all fell, right? And right then, right at the back, right at the beginning of Genesis, um, God promises he's going to raise up a new Adam, a, an Adam who would restore the relationship between God and man, mankind. And then, if you know the story, you know, and then you find out that the promises then get focused in on Abraham. So it was a generic promise that I'm going to restore all people. And, but then it gets focused in on Abraham, and he gets called. And if you know that, and the blessing for him was like, actually, I'm going to make you, you know, a great nation, and the nations will be blessed through you. And he talks about he'll be established forever. And so there's this focusing in on, the, on Israel. And so now they represent humanity, and actually the Savior is going to come from Israel. But then that prophetic word and those promises get further uh, focused in, and it's on the king. You see, the hope of humanity is all tied now in the king. The king is represented of the people. And so he is saying, uh, that, and that prophetic word for, for David was like, I'm going to establish someone in your lineage who is going to establish my kingdom. He is going to reign forever. He is going to restore all things. And so your covering and your kingdom when you come under that throne, that is going to be the everlasting kingdom. And so the king carried the promise. And in verse 13, he says that when the, you know, when the offspring, when the kings, the little kings, the lineage does wrong, I'm going to punish the nation. I'm going to punish the king. And if you look down through history, the, 12, the 10 tribes, the northern kingdom, 
you know, split and they did their thing and, uh, and, it, and really did they, their lineage last two or three generations. They, you know, they constantly, they sort of went to, they honored God and they drifted away and, and the kingdom was taken off the king and he was punished and then someone else was put in place. Um, not so the, the southern kingdom, Judah, which was uh, Judah and Benjamin together. Their lineage, and their king, although they, they were punished and, they, uh, you know, and they, the kings obviously, you know, generations went through, it was always in the line of David that that succession was kept. Right through the exile, uh, there was always uh, a king. And the, or the, the David, uh, Davidic lineage was preserved. And so, David, uh, so God is saying, I'm going to deal with humanity through the king. The covenant with the king is a covenant for humanity. The covenant of how God will save humanity is wrapped up in the covenant for the king and the kingship and his rule uh, and, and his, uh, the everlasting dominion and kingdom. So you can see right there is this divine exchange. It's, it's sown into these promises of this king that was going to come and save. And listen to this. This is, this is Gabriel, like the angel who came to Mary in Luke 1, 30, 33. He says, so this is the promise that, that Gabriel is giving to, um, to Mary, the, you know, the mother of Jesus in the first Christmas. And the angel, but the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Listen to this. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. I will be his father, and he will be my son. The Lord will give him a throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. So, had she, so this, this, the king has arrived, and this is what Gabriel's prophesying over Jesus, that he is the one, that the entire history and the promises of that going all the way back from, to Genesis for humanity, for Israel, for the king, he is the one who carries it. So Jesus is on the path, and he's walking up to 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 Jerusalem, built by his father, his, you know, in the lineage, David, the king, is going there, and then he hears a blind man on the side of the road say, son of David, have mercy on me. Wow. It just says he just stops. What did he hear? He heard faith. A beggar, a blind man with no hope. Everyone just telling him to shut up. You're not important. Jesus heard faith. That's why he stopped. He heard someone say, you're the Messiah. You are the healer. You can change my situation. Have mercy on me, Jesus. And he stopped for him. And he will stop for you too. And he wants to pick up the pieces. And he wants us to, 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 you know, to walk in and to come in behind his kingdom and follow him. And, and this is what is happening here on the side of the road you know, with blind Bartimaeus. That the promise for all humanity is standing in front of him. And Jesus says... He's like, you know, I, I bet you he must have been thinking, I can work with that faith. <laughs> I can work with that. And, uh, and so, and his response is, he just says, call him. I can't see him. Call him. You know, and so the, 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 all the crowd, they, they call to the blind man in verse 49 here. He says, cheer up. <laughs> On your feet. He's calling you. You know, and so they, they flip from being like, you know, shush. To, oh, bro, it's your lucky day. Like, my goodness, you know, on your feet. And it says, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. It's interesting, that cloak was everything for him. That, that would have been his shoulder, his warmth. That would have been the cloak that he would have laid out in front of, you know, like, a bit like, you know, the um, buskers, you know, that, that people would have thrown money onto that would have collected his money. 
And, and so it's significant that he just left that aside, that he just jumps up and he's like, wow, Jesus is calling. I'm, I'm moving. I'm coming towards you, Jesus. And uh, it's, so he didn't, uh, and this is this question. And so a blind man comes to him. And so Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks him. And the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Wow. It's interesting that Jesus didn't see him as a problem. He didn't, even though he, ha- he you know, it was obvious, that I imagine that he was blind. It's like he asked the question, well, what do you want me to do for you? And it's incredible. That is the same statement in, then in verse 36, just a couple of paragraphs back, that that Jesus asked his disciples, the sons of Zebedee, who were wanting to be the greatest. And he's like, well, what do you want me to do for you? And the answers couldn't be more different, eh? Like, they're like, man, we want extraordinary glory. Like, we want to be super awesome and, and be on the right and left of your throne, you know, not asking much. You know, and Jesus is like, man, you have no idea what you're asking. Like, I don't even have the authority to assign those seats, you know. And so there's this blindness in their eyes that they, they don't see their own, you know, um, their own ambitions and arrogance at times. And, 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 and yet this blind man just goes, man, I just want to see. He, doesn't, he just, wants to enca- just wants to encounter him. So the question, it's not so much like, you know, oh man, look at the disciples. And, but actually the question, what do, what do I not see? What are my blind spots? What am I missing? You know, I, actually, when I was thinking about it, what if, if Jesus stood right in front of you and right in front of me and said, Ian, what do you want from me? What would be your answer? Like, what would it be? I mean, that's a massive question. Now, we know who Jesus is, right? And so if he stood in front, like, what do you, what do you want from me? Oh, I just, you know, is it a job? <laughs> you know, is it, oh, my, I want to do really well on this exam. Is it, you know, so much of our wants, and it's about us, right? And and, and this is, you know, and, and actually... God has so much, Jesus has so much grace. You know, he, he, worked, he still worked with his disciples and they're still part of the crowd, right? They're still there with him. And, uh, and, but he's asking, what do you want with me? What do you want me to do? And it's, I wonder with Bar- Bartimaeus, um, yeah, what did he see? Being blind that we that we miss at times, you know, we 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 don't see it, do we? We don't see it until things go sideways or uh, we're in challenges. And uh, as Greg was sharing um, that his brother Ray, when he went blind, um, actually it sort of came out before too. Uh, we were chatting that that um, all the other senses are, are sharpened; they're sharpened up massively. And he could Ray, this is he could tell where he was in the house by by sound he could by hearing what what was on the floor and how and the the bounce back of the how far down the hallway by this the sound by you know bouncing back where, whether he's further away or he could tell a distance of cars apparently on the road or he could tell he could tell so much more than what we would ever know um, because his hearing was so highly tuned he could tell when people were you know, antsy all that, because he could hear their feet shuffling on the carpet. You know, he could hear tone and attitudes and voices that, you know, we would just, just wouldn't even notice. Bartimaeus sees Jesus better than most of us. But you notice that in the story, it's not really about the healing, it's, 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 it doesn't really explain, like, you know, kind of uh, what happened. Actually, the last part, it just, in Mark, and the, he says, go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received the sight and followed Jesus along the road. And that's it. So the, 
the healing's not even really the focus. It's the sense of discipleship and this journey and this encounter that, and the faith that Bartimaeus had, the faith that, that attracted Jesus. And, uh, and it says that he didn't stay in the same place. He moved. He started on the side of the road on, by the way. He has this encounter with Jesus, and the next minute he's on the road following. And I was thinking about it, and uh, there's a, you know, you heard that truth, or that the saying is that he who hesitates is lost. Like, I could so imagine Bartimaeus, like, he might be thinking, man, the, has, the hassle, the getting, oh, you know what, I'll just wait till Jesus passes again. I'll just wait till the next time when it's a bit quieter and no one else is around. Jesus never walked that road again. That was the one time. That was the one chance. That was, it was now or never. It was a Kairos moment. It was like, you're going to call and step out and overcome the, your fears, overcome your biases of people. And, and I was thinking about that. And, and I was, so what is that? It's almost like, ultimately, it's kind of a form of pride. It's actually kind of like, you know what? Other people's opinion is more important to me than reaching out to Jesus. He was more, you know, if, if, that, if that, you know, I know so many times where, you know, where we pull back because of we're worried about what other people think. But uh, there's so much in that, you know, in that we can learn from him. And, that, and one thing is his hunger. It's that man, he, and, and despite all his disadvantages and everything else, that he knew that Jesus was the son of David. See, every God-fearing Jew knew those promises about the king and about a messiah to come and so him speaking son of david like that he was like you're my hope and i don't care what's happening but i'm gonna shout out even louder no matter what how angry or how frustrated the crowd is but i need you jesus i need you to stop i need you to hear me and uh and so he didn't hesitate see desperation attracts jesus and his healing followed was followed by action. He got up and he followed. He could see. See, true discipleship is not about sitting. It's about following. It's about um, not necessarily knowing all the answers and having it all together. But it's about, and symbolically, he left his old life behind. He left the cloak. He never went back for it. He just started following Jesus to Jerusalem. And, uh, and so he went. In the, in the Greek, the word, when it says, uh, when Jesus responded there and he says, your faith has healed you, the word healed there is sozo, and it means sa- saved. It's the same word, salvation, sozo. And, it, and it, uh, so it's like, it's a play, or not a play, but it's, a, it's a, the bigger expression is that actually, you know, your faith has saved you. Saving faith means that we follow. And we... Um, on the, at youth group on Friday night, we had a panel and we were talking about um, marriage and we were talking about sex and relationships and that sort of stuff. And, and it was really cool. And, and, um, and I, I asked one of the youth at the end of the night, and I was like chatting to her, and I said, oh, so what have you learned? You know, what do you think? And uh, what did you pick up? And she sort of, sort of cracked up and said, oh, well, don't have sex before marriage. And I thought, oh, yes. Like, woohoo! That's what, if that's what you've worked out, that is awesome, you know. And, uh, but I thought, actually, that's kind of discipleship, isn't it? It's like you might have a whole lot of opinions about stuff, and, and maybe you haven't quite worked out, like you couldn't maybe defend that position necessarily. In it. But it's like, actually, if that's what Jesus wants me to do, done deal. Argument's over. I'm, that's the way I'm going to go. I'm going to walk and follow him in that way and honor uh, God in terms of my my relationship. That's that's saving grace, isn't it? That's that is uh, that is what faith actually looks like. It's simply uh, not focusing on the you know our situation, but to focus on it that we have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords in our midst. That He is the one who uh, who did it all for us. The divine exchange. That, uh, that he followed through and he went to Jerusalem. They were all excited. He was going to the cross. 
Less than two weeks, he's dead, hanging on the tree, hanging on the cross, tortured for you and me. The last Adam, the one who fulfilled every part of the law, who restored humanity to God. And you can keep tracing it all the way through. You read in Corinthians, and Paul, he talks about that we are living stones, that we are the tabernacle of, of uh, the, the temple of of, of Jesus, of the King, uh, so that, that the Holy Spirit lives within us, that, and that is the kingdom that will never end, right? It's, the, it's not bricks and mortar, it's not the, the temple on the Temple Mount in, in Israel, it is, it is you and me, it is the church, it is, this, uh, it is the fulfillment of this kingdom of what Jesus did, um, being the last Adam. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you as we uh, wrap up, if uh, the team want to come up, um, I really do believe actually that there's just, yeah, there's, there is a real anointing for breakthrough this morning for people. It's like if you want to put things back together, you want to give God uh, the, um, well, that question of like, what is Jesus asking Bartimaeus? What do you want me to do for you? What do you. What would you like Jesus to do for you this morning? What is that question? What does that question look like? And I'd love to pray for healing this morning. Uh, we just had a, a uh, testimony from Gay, and, uh, and I really believe that God wants to bring breakthrough. He wants to break some chains. He wants to uh, set people free. To, he wants people to get off the side of the road, you know, and follow him and, uh, and uh, in discipleship. So, um, yeah, if that's you, I really encourage you to, uh, to yeah, if you would like to respond, I want some prayer for an, in an area, then please do. But, yeah, would you like to stand? I'll just pray. Father, I thank you for, for Bartimaeus. Lord, I thank you for his hope. I thank you for his passion and his hunger. And I pray, Lord, for a stirring of that in people's hearts this morning, Lord, that help us, Lord, at once, Lord, that we will be hungry for you, Lord, that we will press in, Lord, that we would not be um, discouraged by the situations that we face, but, Lord, actually, that you stand there, and, Lord, that you are, you've stopped on the side of the road for us. Lord, I pray for activating faith this morning. Lord, I thank you that you're the God who heals, you're the God who transforms, Lord, as, um, Lord, I thank you for the promises that you've said over people, Lord, that Gay testified, Lord, that she had that promise just after that, um, uh, the, the bleed on the brain. And for two and a half years, Lord, she held on to that, Lord, and then a breakthrough came. Father, I pray this morning for those who are holding on to promises. Lord, we want to remind you them of this morning. And Lord, um, Father, we just pray for a breakthrough this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Feel free to, uh, to come up. Feel free to stay for a coffee and a tea and a catch up and uh, have a great day.